Okay, so this is the question that you see linked from the, the lecture page. And it's a, it's a nice set of illustrating multi-block problem solving strategy um, in a way. Uh, it, it shows the value of the multi-block problem solving strategy because the kind of question that's being asked here. If you're trying to answer it using only your intuition, you will find this, uh, find it difficult. There are aspects of the question here. Uh, intuition alone gets you only so far. And undisciplined, um, disorganized problem-solving strategies, which, you know, for a lot of you, you are smart. <laughs> you know how to figure things out yourself. And, and that might have gotten you quite far. But at some point, it's like in sports, having a proper form in doing a particular task. And sometimes those proper forms don't come. Uh, it's not the most intuitive thing. And um, that's what I hope you have seen as you are working through Newton's law problem solving strategy questions or what we call standards to strategy questions. And um, I want to illustrate that. We did this question from, uh, we used to use a worksheet for in-class group work. And this that's where this question comes from. Um, if anyone's interested in the worksheet, I'm happy to share it. But uh, well, it, we're not using them this semester. so. So this is the one question that I thought uh, I, sh I should really record myself going through it um, to uh, because it's a, um, um, it's a good illustration of the value of the standard strategy. So, uh, so this is the setup. You have two blocks uh, that can potentially move relative to each other. I think it says, yeah, all surfaces are frictionless. So I have a, a ramp of mass M that's a sitting on a, a tabletop. And unlike a usual circumstance, this is free to slide. And I have a block of mass M that's um, sitting on top of it. And, oh, I think this is a good thing to simulate in Algodoo. So, so let me do that. Let me go to Algodoo and just simulate this setup. Okay. Um, so let me draw those um, objects. Let's see here. I need some way to draw straight lines. Okay, so we have a ramp. And let me just uh, have a small block of some mass. Let's see here. Okay. <laughs> um, let me make all surfaces frictionless. Then I think that most people have some intuition for what these blocks will do. If I simply um, simply let go, simply let the simulation run, and blocks do this, the ramp moves to the left, the block slides to the right. Yeah, and the setup of this question is okay. Um, and you're we are going to do different things. Apply some force to the ramp, and as we apply some force to the ramp, what kind of stuff happens? So, um, so we have just done what what happens if we apply zero force? Okay. Um, Let's see what happens if I if we start applying some amount of non-zero force. So, oh, I don't know the amount here. Let's start out with the five newtons. See what it does if I apply five newton of force. Okay, um, the block still slides down. Now, I guess the five newton was enough that the ramp doesn't get pushed to the left. It ramp slides to the right. And let's just increase the force and see if uh, anything more interesting happens. Increase the force to 10 newtons and see what happens. I think all this green is really clashing with my color sense. <laughs> Let me just change the color for this thing. Uh, okay, I guess that's... I think that's better. <laughs> Okay, so I'm applying 10 newtons on the ramp. 
All right, nothing has changed much. Uh, let me go up to 20 newtons. I don't know. I haven't done this ahead of time, so I don't know in, at what forces we would have some more interesting thing happening. Okay, uh, with the 20 newtons, something has changed. So, I mean, this is sliding down still, but it's not sliding down as quickly. Okay, um, let me try increasing this force up to 30 newtons. Oh, so as some amount of force, you see this block actually sliding up. And I hope this uh, agrees with your intuition that um, you have enough of a real world experience <laughs> with some, where, uh, you know, and you can uh, draw from similar um, experiences where you have some kind of a wedge, you have something that's sitting on it. If you really push hard on the wedge, then things slides up. That, um, I hope that uh, um, that doesn't, those are two different things happening, depending on how hard do you push on the wedge with the 30 Newton, it slides up. And with a smaller amount of force, it slides down. That those things happen, it's uh, the fact that those things happen that agrees with your intuition. So we did that demonstration and assumption that that's uh, how it should happen. Now, what we want to work out is, okay, so you have some phenomenon that depends on how much force you apply. And the question is, um, is there an exactly right amount of force you can apply with which um, the block will stay at rest relative to the ramp? Uh, more precisely meaning it won't, it won't slide up or slide down. So, so that's the question. And um, so we basically went through A and B. <laughs> and so now we will find how much force F to apply so that the small block M does not slide down the wedge. So um, so we'll let's uh, work through the standard strategy to figure this out. Um, let's see here, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll just redraw the figure. Um, we have the ground, the wedge of mass M and incline angle of theta. And we have the block of small mass M. And we are applying some kind of force on it. And if someone simply asked, you know, what force F do you apply so that uh, the block doesn't slide down, this is where I hope you will see the limitations of just the intuitive approach. Because with the intuitive approach, I think people can maybe get as far as this. You can get as far as saying um, uh, Newton's second law forces mass times acceleration. So big mass. So you maybe have enough intuition to say um, you should be considering the total mass and then you have it times by acceleration. And Intuition will get you maybe this far and no farther. And, um, and in this expression, you have two unknowns. You have the applied force that you don't know, and you have acceleration that you also don't know. So, um, so this is the limitation of um, non-systematic problem-solving approach. So, so we'll approach this systematically the standard strategy that we teach. The first step in standard strategy is drawing the free body diagrams. Here we have two objects. So I'm gonna need to draw two free body diagrams. Let me do that. I have a free body diagram of the ram, and I have the free body diagram of the small block. I'll go through drawing the forces quickly since um, you've done this many times. <laughs> I don't need to really belabor the point of uh, um, you know, you start out with gravitational force and then you keep asking yourself, did I draw the forces? And, uh, well, I need to draw the apply the force F. And I do know the ramp is not accelerating, um, you know, in this diagonal direction. So if for the ramp to, ramp to accelerate horizontally, there must be normal force. Um, and 
you might think you drew all the forces here. Let me move on to the next free body diagram of the small mass M. And, you know, there's still gravity acting on it vertically. Um, now the surface of contact here is um, angled. So I have to have that angle in mind and draw normal force this way. Oh, wait, it's two different normal forces. Let me draw this N1, N2. And, um, and if you, so if the ramp is accelerating to the right horizontally, then if the small mass M is neither sliding down nor up, then it must be accelerating the exact same way, so, uh, horizontally uh, with the same magnitude of acceleration as the ramp. Um, and with these two forces, you can make the forces add up so that the small mass M has horizontal acceleration. That looks fine. And now the most common mistake people will make it here, and this is the kind of thing that's difficult to, to get intuitively, is people will forget about Newton's third law. So you have to do Newton's third law check, by which I mean for every force that you have in your diagram, you need to, to either be able to characterize it as an external force, meaning force being applied by an object outside of your system, or you need to be able to characterize it as, um, or you need to be able to, if it's an internal force, you need to be able to find the action reaction force pairs. So for a lot of the forces, they will be external. Uh, gravity is an external force because it's coming from Earth. I'm not drawing free body diagram of Earth. Um, apply the force F is also external. Whatever agent is applying the force, I don't have diagram of that agent. Normal force one that's coming from this uh, surface of contact here. So it's also external since I'm not drawing free body diagram of the tabletop. And ah, this uh, normal force here, it's coming from the ramp, which means it's an internal force. So I must have a reaction force on ramp by the uh, block M. And I'm going to use the same label here because this is really the usefulness of Newton's third law. Once you identify a pair of forces as action reaction force, then you can immediately say that their magnitudes are the same. Uh, a lot of students <laughs> kind of get them backward. You start by looking for equal and opposite forces and try to pair them up. No, it doesn't work that way. You first find a pair of forces that um, describe the interaction between two objects. And once you find a pair, then you can say they are equal in magnitude. So, okay, so that's my complete free body diagram. And um, I'm, um, yeah, so, okay, that's my step number one. Always the step that takes, uh, if it doesn't take the most amount of time, it does, should take the most care. Uh, again, um, forgetting this Newton's third law pair, it's a common makes, mistake that I've seen people make and it comes down to lack of care. Okay, so step number two, I need to define my coordinate axis. And this is actually a tricky part with this question um, because it comes down to your direction of acceleration is unusual. Whenever you have an incline, people are used to seeing acceleration go down the incline. And sometimes people kind of automatic go into that uh, groove, rut, and you know, pay attention to your direction of acceleration. Horizontal acceleration means that you want to choose horizontal as your x direction. So uh, surprisingly to, I think, many people who might not have seen this question before, uh, here you want to choose a straight axis um, so that your x-axis is along the direction of acceleration. And I guess for the ramp, it's not all that surprising that you would also choose a straight axis. Okay. So with those axes chosen, you now need to do step number three, decompose your forces into components, X and Y components. And you see that, okay, so I need to decompose this N2 into X and Y components. And I think that's the only force. I guess that's nice. So this is the X component. This is the Y component. And I try to draw this in a way that I can now see the triangle with this angle here. Uh, that might not be the angle I know. Okay, I need to be careful here. Let me just uh, let me just uh, 
carefully draw auxiliary figures that highlight what angles I know and <laughs> how that um, how that angle is corresponds to the angles in the triangle. So the angle that I'm given is the angle of incline, which might be given as this angle here. That's my theta. So let me just track through a few angles here. Um, so this angle here is 90 degree minus uh, theta, which means this angle here is also theta. Oh, I guess I could have done it directly, whatever. Um, so, okay, this angle here is gonna be 90 degrees minus theta because it's 90 degree angle, which means it's a, this angle here that's actually theta. Okay. And uh, this uh, exercise is something that you should go through for every setup, every situation. Because um, uh, exercise meaning uh, drawing the right triangle that shows the decomposition, decomposing of the forces, and then you go through this uh, geometry exercise of which of these uh, angles are theta. Because um, uh, people sometimes get into habit of just, uh, uh, you know, associating X with the cosine and Y with the sine, and doesn't all, it maybe works out that way 50% uh, of the time. So, uh, um, so, okay, so I decomposed my forces and I identified this angle theta um, and I guess I might as well do this step of um, uh, writing down the expression for the magnitudes of these uh, for, uh, components now. So the magnitude of the X component, since it's on the opposite side of the angle, it's uh, N2 sine theta, opposite side of the angle. And for the uh, vertical component or the Y component, since it's uh, the adjacent side of the angle, it's n to cosine theta. So yeah, here in this particular case, the x component turned out to be uh, cosine theta, not cosine. And these components will be exactly the same for um, the n2 in the other free body diagram. I guess that's maybe one benefit of having the same coordinate axis, because whatever decomposition you did in one should also match for the other. That may not be the case if uh, some of your axes were not pointing the same way. Okay, that's step number three. Now we are finally <laughs> ready to step number four after, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes of considering this question. In step number four is where we write down Newton's second law equation. This is our primary uh, problem solving tool. We write down a system of equations, and in that system of equation, we are hoping that we have the same number of unknowns as equations. So let's, let me write that. So uh, I have two objects moving in two-dimensional things. So I have potentially up to four equations to write. I need to write the uh, net force for the ramp in the x direction, net force again for the ramp in the y direction, and net force for the block in the x direction, and net force for the block in the that's x, y direction. And um, some of the, these equations might turn out to be trivial. In this case, I don't think that will be the case. So let me just write the four equations and see what I have. I have, um, so net force on the block, uh, ramp in the x direction. I have the applied force F minus the, in the going in the negative x direction, the x component of N2. I wrote that as n to sine theta. So minus n to sine theta, that out to equal the mass times acceleration. Okay, let's keep going. That force in the y direction, uh, oh, there's a few. Um, I have the normal force n1, and then I have the downward forces, the y component of n2 and mg. So minus n to cosine theta, minus uh, big mg is equal to zero. We are not accelerating vertically. That was the whole point of why we chose our axis the way we chose it. Okay, let me write this down for the small block. Um, so horizontally, oh, there's only one force, n2 sine theta. That's the entirety of um, horizontal force for the block. That should be equal to small m 
times acceleration, and then we have y components of forces again, um, and to cosine theta minus mg is equal to zero. So this is the uh, what I call end of a standard strategy. Again, standard strategy, it doesn't so answer the question for you, but it hopefully leaves you at a place where you have enough information to answer the question in a few more steps, just going through the algebra. Let me check to make sure I have enough information. So I have one, two, three, four equations. So my hope is that I have exactly four unknowns, not less, not more. <laughs> Let's see. Apply the force F, I don't know, so that's one unknown. N2, I don't know, so that's two unknowns. Theta, I'm given. Mass, I assume I know it, <laughs> or I can at least measure it. Acceleration, I don't know that. That was the objection I raised here, that this uh, equation is in terms of two unknowns. Okay, three unknowns so far. Um, N1, I don't know that either. Don't automatically say N1 equals mg because it actually that isn't even right. And even if it's right, you would have an equation that illustrates that. So you still count this unknown. Um, I think, did I, I think I counted all the unknowns. All the other uh, symbols are already counted. So I do have four unknowns, which means, yeah, I have, um, I have <laughs> four equations, four unknowns. So it ought to be solvable. And the biggest challenge at this point is um, going through the algebra. A system of four equations is um, quite a large system. And it's uh, one of those things where um, unless you plan and go through these steps deliberately, you can um, easily get stuck in a loop. <laughs> So uh, so let me illustrate that algebra since um, this is one of the rarer circumstances where the algebra itself could be tricky. So um, this is how I like to plan my algebra. So we are looking for a particular quantity, a force that is required to do something that was our or whole setup of the question. So what that means is this force I'm looking for it, but it's the thing I want to solve at the very end uh, because um, at each of the intermediate solution steps, what you're going to see me do is I'm going to solve for an unknown and I'm going to use the solved expression to eliminate the unknown from all my other equations. So, so that's why I want to solve, solve for force at the very end, not at the beginning or intermediate. Uh, it's Kind of counterintuitive because the quantity you want is what you hold off for solving until the very end. So um, I see here, um, so this is one of the equations that has acceleration. So I think I am going to solve for acceleration here and plug, plan to plug it in there. Yeah. And so then I'm going to have N2 as an unknown. And even though I do see N2 here, this equation is not going to be useful because it has another unknown N1. So when I solve this for N2 and plug it in, <laughs> I will just have exchanged the N2 for N1. And that doesn't really advance my goal. And looking farther down, I see this equation, which has no other unknown other than N2. So I can solve for N2 here plug it into all my other expressions to eliminate them too. So let me do that. So I'm going to do um, solving equation three for A and plug it in here first, and then do the, the thing I just described. Uh, you can do this in different order. Um, I, I think the important thing to realize here was that equation two is kind of useless. So I'm not gonna work with this at all. I mean, if you want you to find the N1, equation two is useful, but I don't care about N1. so. I'm just not going to involve equation two at all. So, okay. So I, from my equations, let me slow down and go step by step. So from my equation three, I have this expression. I'm solving this for acceleration. My acceleration is N2 sine theta over small m. I'm going to plug that into equation one. So with the equations one and three, I get this expression. 
that has only two unknowns, f and n2, f minus n2 sine theta is equal to big M times this expression for acceleration, n2 sine theta over m, small m. Okay, I have, um, um, yeah, let, let me just keep going. <laughs> um, well, let me simplify it a little bit because I, I see an easy simplification. If I um, move this over to the right hand side, then I have um, I have this plus n two sine theta, and I think I can actually factor out n two sine theta. And when I do, this is the whole simplified expression. Force f is equal to n two sine theta times big M over small m plus one, one here. Um, you can distribute it back and double check that I didn't make any mistakes. Um, now we have this N2 that uh, we can eliminate N2 using equation four. So from equation four, I have N2 is equal to M small mg over cosine theta. So plugging that into here, what I get is small m times g sine theta over cosine theta. So let me write that as tangent theta and times uh, big M over m plus one. And if you really want to simplify it, you can simplify it a little bit. I see that if I distribute the small m in, then I get uh, cancel this out and this becomes small m. So sum of the uh, masses times g tangent theta. And that's the kind of result that you wouldn't guess intuitively. And if you compare this with uh, this intuitive thing here, you do see some of the uh, matching things. Uh, I have this sum of the masses, sum of the masses. So I guess the acceleration must be g tangent theta. And if I go back to these equations and solve for acceleration, you should find that acceleration is g tangent theta. Um, so, so, you know, intuition is an uh, completely worth less, but it doesn't take you quite far in solving complicated uh, setup like this one. For a complicated setup like this, really the solution approach you need is the systematic problem solving approach that we teach, what we call standard strategy, or your textbook and the portable TA uses different names, but they all refer to the same multi-step systematic approach. Um, the systematic part is geared at um, Coming up with these, oops, uh, that coming up with these system of equations, and once you have the system of equations, then the rest is algebra. And uh, and if even when doing the algebra, it does uh, it does help to be systematic. And but I, I think algebra portion is easier because if you get stuck, then you keep um, you keep trying different approaches, and eventually you will get at the correct result. Uh, but in coming up with these equations, unless you have the right approach for doing that, like without the equations to solve for, you are stuck. So, so okay, this question uh, from old worksheet that we used to use, um, I want you to do that. It's a good question for illustrating the power of the standard strategy.